Big Ag will tell you that you have to pay attention to the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels in your soil and your plants won't grow without those three. I wholeheartedly disagree. I think the only thing that you have to make is really, really good compost and you will have all of those and more on demand whenever your plant needs it. So doing an individual nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium test isn't really a good indicator of how good your soils are because that's just what what's available at that moment in that literal little square inch right there so the solution to constantly buying fertilizers buying all these inputs and then applying them to your soil which is eventually just going to kill the organisms and, and it's going to be counterproductive to what you need to do because you're producing salts in the soil all you need to do is make really really good compost over this past year i've shown you guys a couple of different ways of making compost well today I finally have my soil biological testing lab set up. Today, we're going to be testing the compost that's under this tarp, and we're gonna be testing some of the garden soil to see what levels I'm at, basically. I'm gonna see what levels, the biological levels my compost is at, and I'm gonna see what biological levels my garden soil is at. Now, keep in mind that this is the first year gardening in about four or five years in this little garden area. So everything went fallow. I came through, cleared it up. If you want to see any of that, just check out previous videos. But this is a permaculture demonstration site that I'm rebuilding and I'm going to eventually turn into a homestead school. Today, I'm going to show you guys what my soils look like underneath the microscope and I'm going to decipher it for you so you guys can understand and you'll be kind of, hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be a little bit fluent or a little bit conversational on what soil biology is and what organisms are beneficial, which ones are not, and what levels you should be having in your soil. So when I first started filming this video, I wasn't yet ready to accept people's soil samples for uh, biological testing, but now I am. So if you would like me to uh, test your soil biology and your soil samples, uh, then email me down below. I will be shortly coming out with a video on how to properly take samples, depending on what it is you're wanting me to test, whether it be pasture, garden, raised beds, anything like that, compost even. Um, so stay tuned for that. That'll be coming out shortly. I don't know if I said it or not, but if you do want me to test it, then hit up the email down below. The same one that says for permaculture consultations, I'll leave a little note so that way you can point it out. Now, while I'm over here on the way to the compost pile, I do want to let you know if you need a permaculture consultation in person, uh, then hit up the email down below. And uh, I will see you guys at the Kentucky Sustainable Living Festival in October. It's all linked down below. Can't wait to see you guys there. Now, this is my oldest and uh, most cured compost pile. So I just watered it this morning. I just applied some more water to it. And uh, let me make sure I have the right bed. That's the garden bed. This is the compost bag. So be patient with the shoddy uh, camera work right now. I'm doing this all with uh, hands and no tripods because sometimes you get distracted with the baby on the way out of the house and you forget to bring a tripod. So um, I'm gonna take samples from basically three sections of this compost pile. There's one right there in the middle. Uh, I'm gonna take another section, another test batch right from over here. And then I'm also gonna take one from over here that's a little piece of weed eater string. I'll put that off to the side for right now and I'll put that in. So there's the test from the compost. I'm going to put this off to the side and I'm going to leave the bag open because I want this still to have access, access to fresh oxygen. Now we're going to go test the uh, garden beds. I'm going to pick three random spots within this garden. Now, when you're doing it from something like this, you wanna make sure you scrape away any of the organic matter. You can see I have some clover seeds right there. Scrape off any of the organic matter from the surface, plunge this down in there, and this is my potato bed. So, there's this scoop right here. There's one scoop. And now we're gonna to go to another random spot on the property. Uh, we'll do this bed right here, and we'll do it on the opposite side. Um, this is my perennial bed right here where I recently did a bunch of chop and drop. But what we're gonna do is scrape away any of the organic material and then we're gonna get a sample like that right in here. Next, we're gonna do another random spot here in the gardens and we're gonna do the tomato and pepper bed. Scrape away any of the organic material. See those nice fine aggregates? You see that? That is good crumb structure in the soil right there. That's a good sign. The only downside is that it's a bit dry right now. So I'm gonna make sure I go get it like a deep shovel full. That way I'm getting down where there might be some moisture. 
It looks about like that. There's some roots in there, but don't worry, that'll come out later. So the next step is to basically take this over to the lab. And uh, remember, I'm keeping these bags open. I'm allowing oxygen to go into them and respirate and all that type of stuff. Um, I'm gonna take these over to the lab and then we're gonna go ahead and see what my soil looks like. Alrighty, so we're back to the soil lab now. And the first thing I'm gonna test is basically my compost. And I'm gonna get, throughout this bag, I'm gonna take a couple of different little pieces through the compost so that way I get like a good representation. And I'm making sure I'm not like accidentally adding, uh, sorry, apparently I can't talk and do this at the same time, but I just need a very little bit of compost, one mil. The reason I captured so much is so that way nothing dies off through lack of uh, habitat basically. So that way I have a better representation of what is actually in my compost. Let me go ahead and get this mixed up and then we'll start looking at some organisms. A fun little fact is that if I take a gram of compost, half of that should be organic material and the other half should actually be living uh, organisms. So that's a cool little fun fact for you, um, is that our soil could potentially be half living organisms, which is why it's so doggone important to have soil biology in your soil as opposed to just NPK. Because the Soil biology is the whole reason there is NPK in the soil or and all the other micro and macronutrients in the soil that are available to your plants. And half the time, those soil tests test for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that aren't even bioavailable to your plants. So enough of that rant. Let me finish this dilution and then we'll get back to looking at organisms. That, I don't know if you guys can see that, probably not, but that is an example of a bad sample, which is one of the frustrating parts of this soil biology stuff is just getting a, it's not even necessarily the microscope stuff that's difficult sometimes. Sometimes it's just getting a proper, properly diluted sample, making sure you don't have like an accumulation of organic materials and all that type of stuff. The organism part gets kind of easy with practice, but this has never gotten easy. <laughs> there we go. Now, place it on my microscope slide. So there you go. You can actually see rocks and minerals on the screen right now, uh, and then also organic material, but you're not actually gonna see any organisms yet, and this is why this has to be a shadowing microscope, is because a lot of the organisms are the same color as water. And I'm speaking fast because I have a time restraint before this stuff all starts drying out. Um, but you need a shadowing microscope because a lot of these organisms are the same color as water. So without a shadow, you're not gonna be able to tell if you're looking at any organisms or a lot of them are gonna be invisible to you. I'm gonna start basically my nematode scan. So I'm gonna scan around the outside first and then I'm gonna do five laneways back and forth over the cover slip and see if I have any nematodes. If I do, I'll try to point them out to you, but they move kind of quick. So you can actually see on there right now, that is a nematode, that is a bacteria feeding nematode. That's pretty cool, that's a good guy. All right, so preliminary, I saw two bacteria feeding uh, nematodes, um, which are good guys, um, but now what I'm gonna do is start doing my first field of view. So this is where I'm gonna test for the rest of the Everything but bacteria, basically. I'm going to be testing for actinobacteria, fungi, omycetes, protozoa, bacteria at the end. Which, the bacteria, the reason it's at the end is because I'm going to have to change the dilution, most likely, of my uh, dilution. So, let's get started. Now, I don't know if you guys can tell, but that little brown guy right in there, you guys are looking through the microscope because I can't get the camera to cooperate right now. That is a very juvenile fungi, basically. Um, he is in the middle of growing, and in fact, he has actually new growth on the tip. That's a good sign. That's a good guy. So there's another beneficial fungi. Has plenty of the clear septa walls. Let me see if I can show you guys. Up in that top corner right there, that's a good fungi right there. And then there's an amoeba just off to the right of it, which is another good guy. Now here is a good example of an amoeba over in that top right-hand corner. That right there is an amoeba. With, filled with bacteria, so you know he's been eating a lot. All right, so that concludes like the main assessment part. Now I'm going to do the bacteria. So this was the original sample. This was a dilution of 10. This is a dilution of 50. So is the question, or answering the question, is my compost any good? 
yes, it is very, very good. Way better than anything you can buy at the store, but it's not where it could be yet. So it's very high in the fungal, uh, in the uh, bacteria levels. Um, decent on the active no bacteria. I don't want too much of that right now, if any. Um, well, it depends on what I'm growing. If I'm growing bra brassicas, then I need actinobacteria. But if I'm not, then I don't really necessarily need high levels of it. Uh, but I'm low on the fungi. So I need to increase the levels of the fungi. Now, one thing I did see while going through here was that there were a lot of fungal spores. Um, that I can't count them yet because they're not beneficial right now as I'm looking at it. But they can be in the future if I provide the right conditions which is beneficial that I know that because I know what, like, what I need is there. I just need to make them hatch, basically. Uh, and I can do that by keeping it shaded, keeping it protected, increasing the watering content, uh, because right now there's a tendency of it just being dry by the time I get there because I'm in Texas and it's in like under a tarp, basically. Um, I can also go get some fungal hyphae from the forest and inoculate my pile with that as well. But uh, the predatory nematodes, I need a divert more of a diversity of nematodes. But it makes sense because what I have mostly of in my compost is beneficial bacteria. I didn't see any bad guys whatsoever throughout this entire sample. Instead of it being at a one, which would be good for what I'm trying to do in the garden, the fung fungi to bacteria being like one to one or just one, um, it's at 0.83 bacteria dominant. So what I need to do is increase the fungi levels in my compost. What I need to do is start providing food for the fungal nematodes. Right now I have food for the bacteria feeding nematodes. And then once those two are being fed pretty well, then the predatory nematodes are gonna start coming in and they're gonna start eating the other nematodes and some of the other protozoa. But what I do have a lot of are amoeba. Uh, I saw one flagellate while I was doing the bacteria dilution, but that doesn't count because it wasn't during the uh, main assessment. So I need to increase the flagellates, but I'm really, really good on the amoeba. There's a lot of amoeba just attacking the bacteria, which is causing that nutrient cycling, which is a good thing because my plants don't benefit until the bottom layer of the soil food web starts getting eaten and pooped out. That's when my other plants start benefiting from that, and that's when they start deriving their nutrients. So, um, there's that. Now I'm going to go ahead and test the garden soil and see where I am on the garden soil, and uh, just see if the, yeah, basically just see where I am on the garden soil. See if I have any bad guys in there. Uh, see if I have any uh, potential for fungal growth. If not, then I can go ahead and add my compost to it and keep up the proper conditions, um, stuff like that. So let me go ahead and test that. I'll spare you guys the details on that unless I see anything cool. Uh, but yeah, we'll recap at the end. Okay, look at this, y'all. First of all, I figured out what was going on with my camera. Second of all, I found... Oh, this is hard to do two-handed. You see that guy? Look at him. I can't tell what he is. Hold on. That is a bacteria feeding nematode right there. Look at him. Oh. Uh, it's probably easier for you guys. I was looking through the microscope. Look at him. Just moving. This right here is an insect leg, so that's pretty cool. All right, now this one is gonna be hard to see, but if you can see that little guy right there in the middle that's just kind of bumbling around, and that is a flagellate, that's a good guy. Okay, so I finished the soil test for the um, garden now, and basically I have a whole bunch of bacteria and no fungi at all, I didn't see any fungi. Uh, I did see a couple of nematodes, and I did see one flagellate, which is good. Um, those are both good. I didn't see any of the bad guys again, um, but yeah, there is that. I have no fungi in the soil, and I need to fix that through compost, basically. I need to increase the fungi count on the compost, and then uh, increase the fungi count in the garden, basically. So I need to provide food, water, and shelter for the fungi to thrive. 
Alrighty, so based on the soil biological tests, my compost is almost ready. It's almost perfect for exactly what I want to grow in this garden, which is vegetables, basically row crops. That's exactly what I want to grow. Um, it's at a ratio of 0.83 fungal dominant, but I need it to be like one. That's what I need the ratio to be. Uh, equal parts bacteria to equal parts fungi, and that will help weed, or that'll help keep the weeds out, keep the pests away, all that type of stuff. Um, I also need to increase the amounts of some of the predator species as well. So there's that. The only way to really to increase those, uh, <clears throat> the only real way to increase those accounts is by you developing more prey. So that way the predators don't get hungry and then die off and stuff like that. So that's what I'm in the process of doing. Um, I might find some old spent mushroom blocks and apply it to the compost. Also, I need to make sure that the water levels within the compost stay up a little bit higher. Uh, just because, I mean, we are in Texas. It is like right now, it's like 90 some degrees outside right now. And my compost is under a blue tarp. If you have it on the inside of like a barn or a shop or something like that, then it'll be a little bit more resistant to outside temperatures. Um, now, as far as my garden beds, I did a, I did a test from three different locations within my garden because um, I wanted to get a general overall view of what my soil was like in the garden. And it's very, very, very bacteria dominant, which makes sense. So one way that I'll increase the fungi levels, because I want to bring this up to a bacteria ratio of one to one, or just one, um, one thing I'll do is go ahead and do, start doing compost extracts once that gets ready. Start doing compost extracts and properly time the soil drenches that I'll do throughout these raised beds. Uh, I want to do it either right before or right after a rain, preferably right in between rains. Like it rained, to, let's, for example, it rains uh, today and then I apply the compost tea tomorrow and then it rains the next day. That would be absolutely ideal. Um, I'm gonna have to be waiting for a little bit longer before that's even a possibility, uh, just because this is part of the dry season. Granted, it's near the end of the dry season of Texas, but that's what I'm dealing with right now. So what I can do in the meantime is get the compost ready. Also, once I do fix the, uh, the soil biology here, it should be a permanent fix. It should be something, as long as I don't, you know, screw up the conditions of the soil, it should be something that is like a one-time fix. Now, by one-time fix, I mean, I might have to do like three applications, potentially, but once it is fixed, as long as I don't screw up conditions, it should stay fixed. So, um, what are some ways you can screw up those conditions? Compaction, herbicides, pesticides, stuff like that. Uh, all of those create bad or anaerobic conditions that are going to limit the amount of fungal and bacteria growth that I have in these garden beds. So hopefully this video was helpful for you guys. Hopefully you guys kind of have a better understanding of uh, what soil biology is and the way it you know, benefits your garden and stuff like that. If you need a soil biology test, just hit up the email down below. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time.